Hello and welcome to episode 15 of Learn English with Photos. My name is Geoffrey Hill and in this lesson I'll be using some photos I took to talk about houses and housing in Britain. In the first part of the lesson I'll tell you about my childhood homes. I'll then go over some of the key vocabulary relating to the topic and finally I'll ask you some questions. So let's begin at the beginning. This is the house in Plymouth where I spent most of my early childhood. Oh, no, sorry, wrong photo. This is the house where I spent most of my early childhood. We had a flat on the first floor. As you can see from this picture, it's an end of terrace house. Nothing much appears to have changed in the past 40 or so years, although the original sash windows have been replaced with double glazing. When I was 11, we moved to a new house on a housing estate in the suburbs of Plymouth. That was in 1966. This is how our house looks today. These so-called dolly houses were built in the 1950s and were originally council houses. This means that they were owned by the local authorities, which rented them to tenants. However, when Margaret Thatcher came to power in the 1980s, she introduced a right-to-buy scheme which allowed council property residents to buy their council homes at bargain prices. As a result, most privately owned houses have been extensively modified and improved whereas the council houses look much the same as when they were built, from the outside at least. For example, my parents had double glazing installed and a conservatory built at the front. They also had the front of the house pebble dashed, which means that it was covered with a mixture of cement and small stones. Compare that with this house, which still has the original windows, and this one, which still has the original front and side doors. Our house has a front and back garden. Unfortunately, the lawn is not looking at its best following a period of drought. At the front there's a brick wall with a gate, with a set of steps leading up to the front door. At the back, a hedge separates our house from the neighbours. There's a concrete path along one side of the lawn, and a washing line for hanging clothes out to dry. We used to have a rock garden, but it was replaced by this patio or terrace some time ago. At the top of the garden, there's a garden shed, which is used to store gardening equipment, tools, paint and the like. Those bushes could do with trimming. Anyway, that's enough about my family's house. Let's look at some other types of housing. One word you often hear in relation to houses is semi, as in they live in a three-bedroom semi. This is short for semi-detached, which describes a house joined to another house by one shared wall. A house with no shared wall is called a detached house. A terraced house is one of a series of identical or very similar houses with adjoining walls on both sides. Although this type of housing is often associated with the working class, historical and reproduction terraces have increasingly become part of the process of gentrification in certain inner city areas. A bungalow is a house built all on one level, without stairs. Many old people live in bungalows since they don't have any stairs to climb. The term bungalow originated in India, where it meant a house in the Bengal style. Many people dream of owning a cottage or small house in the country. If you are very rich, you may be able to afford a traditional thatched cottage, which has a roof made of dry straw or reeds. Here you can see a thatcher working on a thatched roof. A mansion is a large, impressive house, and a stately home is a large, impressive house of historical interest, especially one that the public can visit. This is Saltram House on the outskirts of Plymouth, a Georgian mansion now owned by the National Trust. There's a saying in English that an Englishman's home is his castle, which sums up the belief that you should be able to control what happens in your own home and that no one else should tell you what to do there. Of course, not everyone lives in a real castle, but some do. This is Inverary Castle in Scotland, the ancestral home of the Duke of Argyll. And if you're a king or queen you will certainly have a palace. Having reached the ultimate in luxury and grandeur, let's turn our attention to some more modest types of accommodation. When I was young, my grandparents lived just around the corner from us, in one of these council flats. As you can see, each flat has a balcony, except those on the ground floor, of course. I should perhaps explain at this point that in American English, the ground floor is called the first floor, the first floor is called the second floor, and so on. You've probably also heard that the word apartment is used in American English for what the British call a flat. That is largely true, 
but we do use the word apartment in British English to refer to a more upmarket form of accommodation. Living in an apartment block sounds much more desirable than living in a block of flats. Another type of housing is the tenement, a large old building which is divided into a number of individual flats. Many tenements are run down and overcrowded, like this one in Paisley, Scotland. If the living conditions are really bad, it can be considered as a slum. In 1960s Britain, there was a big boom in high-rise housing to meet the increased demand for affordable accommodation. After a while, it was realised that people didn't like living on the 21st floor and many of these so-called tower blocks have now been demolished. But with house prices having gone through the roof and space being at a premium in many cities, towers are coming back into fashion, albeit with a more modern design. However, for many people, the English way of life is best represented by the village, which can be defined as a small community or group of houses in a rural area. This is Milton Coombe, a few miles from Plymouth. And of course, no self-respecting country village would be complete without a village pub. When you go on holiday, you might stay in a caravan, a mobile home or a beach hut. You might think that a beach hut such as this one in Branscombe, Devon, would be quite cheap. But you'd be wrong. Some beach huts in prime seaside locations change hands for tens of thousands of pounds, though prices have come down since the start of the economic crisis. Having covered the most common forms of housing, we're now going to look at some vocabulary for parts of the house, starting with windows. A bay window is a window that sticks out from the outside wall of a house, like the ones on the first floor of these attractive houses in Lyme Regis. French windows, which originated in 17th century France, are a pair of glass doors which you go through into a garden or onto a balcony. A dormer window is a vertical window in a room that is built into a sloping roof. In this photo, we can also see the gutter which collects the rainwater falling onto the roof, and the drain pipe which carries the rainwater from the roof to the drain. The chimneys carry smoke from any fires inside the house up into the air. The TV aerials and satellite dish may not look very pretty, but you couldn't watch your favourite programmes without them. Most roofs are made from slate or tiles. This house has a slate roof, and this one a tiled roof. A porch is a small area at the entrance to a house, which is covered by a roof and often has walls. A garage is always useful, and is often to be found at the end of a drive or driveway. If you have green fingers and a big garden, you might decide to have a greenhouse. But be careful not to throw stones. Finally, another difference between American and British English. In Britain, a yard is a flat area of concrete or stone, usually at the back of a house, which often has a wall or a fence around it. Americans, on the other hand, use the word yard to mean garden. Well, that completes the first part of the lesson. Now it's time for you to do the talking. I'm going to ask you a series of questions about houses and housing. I suggest you pause the video to give yourself time to answer. And try to give as much detail as possible. Question 1. Where do you currently live? Question 2. Describe the house or flat where you live. Question 3. What do you like or dislike about it? Question 4. How many other homes have you lived in? Give details. Question 5. If you had the choice, would you prefer to live in the city or the country? Why? Question 6. Would you rather live in a house or a flat? Why? Question 7. Describe the house in the picture. Question 8. Describe your dream house. OK, that's the end of this lesson. I hope you found it useful, and I look forward to working with you again on another episode of Learn English with Photos.